And this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Sarah Mabrook. She is the producer and the director of a wonderful documentary film called The Food Cure. Please welcome her to the show. Thank you so much for being here all the way from Berlin, Germany. Thank you so much for having me. One of the good things about Corona is this is more easy to do. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's actually how this show got, got uh, created was out of the need for creating community and a sense of connection. And I just started going live a couple of times a day. And apparently there were people who valued it and, and watched it. And I'm meeting amazing people like you that without the virus, I might not have really crossed paths with. So thank you for reaching out to me and allowing me to see this beautiful, beautiful film, The Food Cure. And even before we talk about the film, where can people view it? And I'll post the link right now, but tell us how we can view it because it's important that they see the film. So um, the easiest thing is to go on our website, which is the food cure, the food cure film .com, And then you can see the different, there's different places where you can see it. There's Vudu and um, Google Play and iTunes and like different places. And it's also available worldwide on Vimeo. Um, but everything's on the website. So that's probably the easiest. Place. That's great. Well, I think the food cure is a fantastic name. And and I, I truly believe his food is medicine. We, we know a lot of people don't. So what inspired, tell us a little bit, of, I know what the film's about, but tell us what it's about and what inspired you to do it. Because it, it was an endeavor of many, many years. You followed these people for years. Actually five. And in the latest update, the final update in the film is at seven years. Um, but yeah, so the title The Food Cure, which is a very provocative title, especially when it comes to cancer, which is the topic um, of the film and which is what the six protagonists have. Um, that's why it's like followed with The Food Cure Hope or Hype because actually I was very skeptical um, that food has anything to do with cancer, particularly with healing cancer. So um, I got started, I'm a journalist and I um, I mostly specialized in the Middle East and in uh, war journalism. Um, I was doing that for a long time and I needed a bit of a break um, from that and came to New York um, and heard something on the sort of local public radio, WBAI, um, about, you know, food nutritional therapies for cancer. And there was a quote by Charlotte Gerson, who is actually in the film, um, saying, oh, well, you know, the cure for cancer was discovered a long time ago, but they just want to suppress it or something very sort of uh, <laughs> sounded very uh, quackish to me. Um, and it, it just really offended me in a way that somebody could say something like that on the radio because two of my close friends are oncologists and I know for a fact that how difficult it is to treat um, particularly end stage cancer and um, and you know somebody going around saying something so obviously wrong um, just irked me so I jotted down the name um, and um, proposed to do a story, a, a magazine story for it, um, and went to Mexico and kind of investigated and researched there and checked out different clinics. And um, the Gerson clinics of all the different sort of alternative cancer clinics there, because in Tijuana, you have like one clinic next to another. Um, the Gerson clinic was the one that seemed the most absurd to me of all of them because it was only food. So the others were sometimes using hyperthermia and poly MBA and sort of different, you know, semi-medical sounding things. Whereas the Gerson um, clinic there was um, purporting to treat cancer only with food. And I knew for a fact, we all eat like how, you know, we would know this if food cured cancer, right? And, you know, it seemed absolutely ridiculous. So um, I began asking like, the ACS and the NCI and doing some research on the statistics for what happens with people who kind of get entrapped into these promises and go there. Um, and I wanted to find out what happens with them and what the survival statistics are and so on. And there were none. So nobody could give me any statistics of any kind. There, was, there were no facts. It was all just sort of strong opinions on both sides. Um, the clinicians over there were saying that they'd yield hundreds, thousands of people, but they couldn't really pro prove it black on white. And the same went for the sort of the conventional um, medical side. They, you know, they say to definitely not do something like this, but they couldn't show a single study to, uh, 
to prove that this was, you know, bad for your health, that it made people die quicker of the cancer or anything like that. So that's when I decided that the only way to really know if there's anything to this at all is to find patients and follow them over time. And um, <clears throat> so I looked for patients that were willing to let me follow them. And initially I wanted to do it for two years because I thought, and some of the doctors I spoke to thought that given how advanced their cancers were two years, you know, by the time of two years of not doing conventional um, treatment, they would, you know, their cancer would advance significantly, their metastases, you know, they would have metastases popping up everywhere, they would probably even die in that time, or, and this is what I was hoping at the time, they would come to their senses and get back on their traditional treatments, and that was sort of what, you know, my idea was. And then everything turned out very, very differently from um, what I expected, and what I saw happening in front of my camera really threw my whole world upside down. And it, I, you know, made me have to really rethink my own prejudices and my own ideas about this. And it became a very, very long, um, long voyage, a long project that I had never thought, probably I wouldn't have done it had I known how long it would be because after two years, um, everyone was doing very well um, and it was the exact opposite of what I imagined so then I decided to keep on um, filming up until the five-year point which is the point where um, patients usually get considered um, survivors cancer survivors um, in the sort of conventional statistics so it became a very long project and a very different project from the one that I set out to do I think it's incredible that you approached it with the mind that like, this isn't even going to work. It's because a lot of times, you know, when I've interviewed Marion Nessel, who's a food politics specialist, she talks about how companies that do research already know what they want when they're deciding what to say on the label and they skew it that way. You didn't have any of these preconceived notions going into this film. If anything, you thought it wasn't going to work. Well, I did have preconceived notions. I mean, also in my own family, we have a lot of my grandfather was a doctor, my uncle is a doctor. I, I had a strong preconceived notion against, and I'm generally, I, I, I don't have a, I don't tend to things that are very sort of esoteric in nature. I, I'm very rational and um, I really, you know, scientific. Um, so, so that just seemed extremely unlikely to me. And, um, and I wanted to show people what really happens when you do something like this with the idea that I could be help save people um, <laughs> and make them, you know, not, not do this kind of approach. Um, and it's not, it's never easy, I think, and I experience it myself, it's never easy to go against your own um, beliefs and your own like deeply held sort of you you have and it requires a lot of openness um, to do it and it requires time and I think um, had I not had that time had I gone there as I initially plan planned just for a magazine article you know I would have gone in written my story as I wanted to with my own notions preconception I would have found evidence for whatever I wanted to see and gone back out and that's one of the things why I think it's so important um, for there to be room for documentaries and investigative journalism and a sort of a deeper, you know, interacting more deeply with what you're reporting on because otherwise this could have never, ha I would have never discovered this had I not stuck to it over time. Yeah, I think it's, ama it's an amazing story. Just your personal story of making the film is a great story. Jill says, as soon as my husband was diagnosed with colon cancer, we went plant-based. Now a year later, they find no signs of cancer. And I hear that all the time. You have, and I can understand that if people want to still do conventional treatment, in addition to changing their diet. But what bothers me, and I mentioned this to you right before the show, is for many years, I volunteered doing pet therapy at a cancer center. And I would sit there while they, people got their infusions and they would visit with my little dog, Bailey. And they would bring them lunch, you know, turkey sandwich with mayonnaise on white bread, chips and a Coke, and then a cookie for dessert. And I wasn't as allowed as a volunteer to talk to them, but they basically, I said, oh, did your doctor tell you about to be on any special diet? Oh, my oncologist says diet has nothing to do with cancer. They actually believe that. 
And there's even doctors, we know that the plant-based diet can reverse autoimmune disease and diabetes and heart disease. And there's doctors that still don't even believe that, even though the evidence shows otherwise. Yeah, I think that goes to show just how much belief, like how unscientific also people are and how, how belief and prejudice is sometimes stronger even than rational um, thinking because um, often what is said is, well, there's not enough um, evidence, there are not enough studies, which is true and which is, uh, needs to be done. But there is enough already um, that no doctor should say that food has nothing to do with cancer. That's, that's absolutely unscientific because we know, and there's absolute consensus on this, that food is an extremely important factor in preventing cancer. And almost, you know, it's, 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 so the notion that food has nothing to do with it is, is um, just absolutely wrong. I think where there's still room for more studies and more sort of um, uh, exploration is, okay, to what extent can food be used in the treatment? And how can it be used together with conventional treatments? How can it be used to support the results and to make sure that, some, that a patient gets into that 30 or 40% that have good results um, and that survive the five years or the 10 year statistics? And how can you sort of help push more and more people and ideally 100% of the patients into that category by helping with the nutrition and the lifestyle changes and so on. And I mean, I think that that is slowly changing. And I, you know, because I started this film so long ago, for me, it's like already a completely different world. When I began this film, I was, you know, doing it on a topic where people looked at me like, I'm crazy to even touch this topic. And what are you talking about food? And can't they get what? Like, it was just completely out there. And now it's not. I mean, a lot of, like the whole food as being in this, you know, very integral part of, or very strongly related to all chronic degenerative diseases, hardly anyone still denies this. I mean, yes, there are doctors that still are sort of uh, back in the 1990s on this topic, but um, I think the world is changing and the medical world is changing um, in this respect. If you ever do any more follow-up or anything with this subject, I'd love for you to meet Dr. Alan Goldhammer, who has a water fasting center in True North in Santa Rosa, where he has actually seen people, you know, overcome cancer. So it's incredible. Yeah, I'm very interested. I, as you saw, Dr. Um, Walter Longo is also in my film, who of course is a big um, proponent of fasting and has done a lot of studies on it, sort of the sort of big studies on fasting. Um, also as it relates to cancer and, and, uh, and chemotherapy and so on. Um, and I still think that, you know, what I hope happens um, or this film helps sort of um, push is that studies need to be done on this. And I think what um, my hunch is that what you will see when you do study these types of whole foods, plant-based diets um, that are low in fat, low in protein, high in, high in high quality carbs, very nutrient dense. What you will see is, it, well, this is my hunch, I don't know this, um, is that you will probably see fasting similar um, reactions in the body, like on the IGF-1, the mTOR pathways, etc. I wouldn't be surprised if you'd see very similar consequences, even though, even though these people are not fasting, they're eating, um, and they're eating a lot. They're just not eating certain things. So like in addition to the food care, we have the no food care. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be another, another film, but definitely worth exploring. How did you find the remarkable people in your film, especially that adorable little boy, Jeremiah, who I'm just, I mean, it's worth to see the film. He's so adorable. Yeah, he's the cutest thing. Um, so actually at Jeremiah, I found his parents, I met his parents, um, on a bus tour. So there are these bus tours um, from, from California down to Mexico that go to all the different alternative clinics. It's kind of like, so that patients can see all the different clinics and, and um, you know, figure out which one they, they want um, or, or even just check them out. So um, I went on this tour with that bus and met the parents and uh, Jeremiah was, six months old at the time and had just been diagnosed 
um, and the parents were not yet sure what they were going to do. And it was a very difficult, difficult um, time for them. And, you know, I was really, it was really difficult for me to even, to even film them because, you know, just it's like talk about being stuck between a rock and a hard place. I mean, the, the, the chemotherapy that he was supposed to get for two or three years, the doctors basically said that the chances that he survives it, I mean, that he dies from it are relatively high. And, and even if he doesn't die from that chemotherapy, he would have all these incredibly um, terrible side effects, including possibly brain damage. So you have that on one side and on, on, on the other hand, um, it's of course not legal to um, not have a minor do the, the treatment that is suggested by the hospitals. Um, and so um, they were considering leaving the country with him um, to undergo this kind of treatment and risking legal you know, effects or having, having their baby taken away from them. So terrible situation um, and very difficult to watch. How did they manage it? Because I wondered that because I, I've heard cases where, where, where parents have tried to refuse and the, and the child was taken away. They must have somehow circumvented that because he's in the film and he's recovered. Well, um, they they were very uh, very lucky on on the one hand, um, they were lucky that it went well, <laughs> um, and also um, Tanya was very smart about the way that she did it. So she um, kind of she went to see different hospitals to get different opinions and kind of gave each hospital the impression that she might be going to another one, um, so that they weren't immediately alerted to this idea that she might do something completely different. Um, and then she, she went to Chile with, um, with Jeremiah and um, I think nobody really sounded the alarm assuming that she was just in a different uh, clinic. And then by the time she got back, his, um, he had already shown such incredible improvement that um, she just continued doing it. That's incredible. That, and I'm so glad that there was nothing that they weren't punished in any way for what they actually, did. Yeah, actually, I didn't. Um, for a little time, I stopped filming them when they decided to go to, to Chile. Um, because, um, and that's why what you see in the film, she filmed herself over there. I didn't actually go to Chile. And the reason I didn't go was because of the legal implications. I didn't want to have footage that would incriminate them. Um, if everything, I just, I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. When I realized they were going to do this, um, I just took a step back and it wasn't until they got back and told me what had happened and, and how much he had improved that I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, that's unexpected. So that, that I started, um, shooting. Are the parents, or well, I know he's still fairly young, but are the parents doing anything to get this word out or they're just kind of living a quiet life now? happy that their son has recovered? Um, I think, I mean, Tanya does a lot, like just locally. I mean, she's, um, she's, uh, she's plant-based and she's super fit and so is Jeremiah. Um, I don't know if she does anything sort of on a, on a formal um, level, but she's, um, she's really, she's really gung-ho. She's amazing. She's got, somebody maybe I could interview her sometime. She, cause I really liked her so much. Yeah, I think you should. She's, she's wonderful. And she's also very articulate and, yeah, I think you definitely should. Thank you. Maybe, maybe you can make the introduction. I would love to because she they were my favorite part of the film. Not that everybody else wasn't Jeremiah, spectacular. Jeremiah as well. I mean, he should be in there for a few minutes because he's, I, um, I mean, he's a big boy now. It always like, it's still like, it astonishes me whenever I see him. Um, I mean, when I see him on Facebook because he's in LA. But yeah, he's, uh, he's a very fit, fit, young man show, who shows off his six pack, <laughs> which is impressive at that age. Um, yeah. He so, also came to some of our, we did some shows um, in the US and Canada. We did a tour um, and he came to a few of them and, and a few of our shows in LA and San Diego. And that was really great. So how did the parents even discover that their six month old child had this cancer what kind of cancer was it and what was what was the food cure for jeremiah it was a very rare form of um blood cancer um that 
had only existed in, in, I mean, they only knew three other cases in children, in young children before Jeremiah. So it was sort of unexplored territory. Um, and um, yeah, that, so, so it's, not, it's not one of the common leukemias or something like that. It's a very, very rare T cell like, uh, yeah. Uh, type that that there, that was one of the reasons also that Tanya and Jean decided to research something else because unlike with some other cancers there wasn't even the even the conventional methods nobody could give them any guarantees of any kind or even show them any statistics because if there's only been three other cases you can't you don't really have any um, any anything to go on. Um, so I think that made it in a way easier for them to make this decision than if it was a very um, standard cancer that you have a lot of um, good stats on. Here's the interesting thing. He's six months old. So it's not like he's eating the standard American junk food diet anyway, right? I mean, he's six months old. So how did they change his food to get him to the point where he actually reversed his cancer? Well, so, I mean, he had a lot of juices so she made juices for him. Um, also, this this was um, called the Manuel Lazeta um, therapy, and part of it is also almond milk, uh, like they with with fresh almonds. She was uh, always like taking off the the um, thingies of, of the almonds and making this milk for him. Um, yeah. So and then of course you know just uh, vegetables and stuff that she would mash up. Um, yeah. That's incredible. He must have like the, uh, the greatest adapt neuroadapted palate now of any kid. I love the scene where I guess he was at school and, and everybody else was eating junk and he was eating something healthy. Yeah, he's impressive to watch when he eats. And also, um, Tanya was telling me that a few times after he was done with his treatment, I mean, I think they, they stuck to it pretty um, hard for, I think, four or five years. Um, and afterwards, they tried to sort of, you know, because obviously he's going to go into um, the rest of the world. So they tried to offer him, I don't know, muffins, whatever, different, different stuff, um, even meat and so on. And he just didn't, he doesn't associate that with food. Like he'd take a bite and then want the real food. <laughs> and that's just impressive. I've never seen a kid like that before. I don't know how it is now. Um, cause I haven't seen him in a while. So I don't know, um, if that's changed now that he's sort of in this pu pre puberty or not, it would be, yeah, it would be interesting to, to see how that evolves when he gets into adolescence and stuff. I hope to meet this extraordinary family. Tell us about some of the other people in the films and how you found them and what kind of cancers they had and whether or not they, well, I don't want to give the whole movie away. So just talk about whatever you like to talk about regarding the people. Um, so there were actually three of the six um, had different kinds of breast cancers. So um, obviously that's one of the most common kinds of cancer. And uh, Marie, um, who's from uh, Montreal, she had um, triple negative breast cancer, which is one of the most aggressive forms. Um, and I, I, I found them all by asking the Gerson Institute to send a sort of letter to patients when when patients ask or potential patients people ask for information um to send a letter saying what i was trying to do and what i wanted to do um and then some people responded and in that letter i said that i'd like to follow people who decide for one of these treatments and that i like to follow them over time no matter what happens um so i didn't get that many people responding <laughs> Um, because I mean, who wants to be, you know, have a filmmaker around um, for years at such a vulnerable time in their life when they don't know how this is going to end? So um, Maria was one of the people who responded, and I just immediately felt that she's a really, really um, special, highly intelligent person, and um, yeah, and she had this extremely aggressive cancer that doesn't do very well with conventional treatments and their chances were not so high for her if she had done the regular chemotherapy and etc so um and she had four relatively young kids so the stakes were very high um and i i first met her actually at the clinic in tijuana 
in, I met, first met her in person there. And I mean, she's just so radiant. And so, um, yeah, that I, that, that I immediately knew this was a, you know, this was gonna, a great sort of protagonist. This was somebody um, who also had this sort of this fire and this energy um, and this willpower that, yeah. And I think you see in the film that, that that's a big part of getting well as well. Amazing. So what was the biggest surprise for you in this film? I think um, what surprised me, well, apart from the initial surprise that food can have these incredible effects. I mean, it's one thing theoretically. Another thing is when you're there with the person getting their scan or their um, test results and sort of seeing it in front of your own eyes, like seeing a tumor shrink um, and all they've done is eat food and <laughs> drink green juices. Like it's just, it's phenomenal. Like when you, when you actually witness that. Um, but the other thing that really surprised me was to what extent um, support is important. Um, that it's not only about food and lifestyle, but there's also this very important element of sort of emotional support and emotional well being and being um, accepted by those around you. Um, and I think I, I would have underestimated the effect of that. And I think in the film, you see very well um, and, and also very tragically um, what, what not having that can do. You know, in 2003, I was, I had already been vegan for 26 years. I've been vegan for over 43 years now. And I was bleeding when I went to the bathroom and I was diagnosed with precancerous polyps and I had a bunch of them in my colon and I didn't, they couldn't remove them. So they wanted to do surgery. And I said, no. And instead I went to a place called the Optimum Health Institute where basically juicing, you know, and uh, it, I mean, we, we ate some food like salads, but it was basically all raw. It was all plants and it was just basically fruits and vegetables, no sugar, oil, salt, alcohol, caffeine, you know, none, none of that. And within six months, I went back and had another colonoscopy and the polyps were gone. And the doctor accused me of having surgery. I, I said, I changed my diet and said, well, that's impossible. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, this doesn't surprise me anymore. And I hear this all the time now. I think once you sort of, once you, um, you start entering into that 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 possibility. You start hearing uh, more and more accounts of, of people who've under, uh, who've had that experience, and um, yeah, it's really it's really incredible because it's the, the thing is that actually I don't understand why I was you know so skeptical about it because really it's very logical. I mean, of course, on a biochemical level, of course, what we put in. I mean, our cells are made out of what we're eating so of course it makes a huge difference what we're putting into our bodies that's the that's that's the fuel that's what's going to determine everything um our hormones all you know our microbiome everything gets determined by the food we put into our body so it's actually very logical it's what's more surprising is that we've sort of been educated or not educated to consider that um we, we assume it's like two different things. The body is just there and then the food you, you know, it's, it's we don't unite these two ideas. So Jeremiah being six months old, he doesn't drive or have a job. So he pretty much didn't get a say in the food that he was given to, to heal. But the rest of the people in the film were adults and how easy or hard was it for them to change the diet? Well, it wasn't the same for all of them. So some struggled more with it, some didn't. Um, and it depended also a little bit on the culture. So you saw that the, there's a, one, um, one of the protagonists is French and um, she, I think, struggled the most with the diet. When the diet is basically whole foods, plant-based with no salt, no sugar, no coffee, no alcohol, um, no, no added fats. Except that's how I eat and I love it. <laughs> And I don't have cancer. I do now and I love it. Um, but, and I think your palate adjusts to it. And now actually I have trouble, like I, I mean, I love it very, very honestly. Like my food is the best food in the world. Like, um, but, but for, for I think 
you also have to sort of um you have to allow that time to to get adjusted to, to get adjusted to it and also there's all this cultural difficulty like for, for and all of the patients in the film complained of it which is that almost all our social interactions are there's food involved food or drink involved and that they all felt very isolated because they were excluded from all that or they felt excluded from all that um and you know for some people that's harder to deal with than others so for instance the the swiss um lady in the film Verena, she found an excellent solution because she would still go to dinners and still go to the restaurant with her friends, but she would just bring her own food and ask, quietly ask the, the, the kitchen staff before to serve her, her the food that she made on a plate as though it would, came from the restaurant. <laughs> so that also nobody would notice, so that nobody would ask her like why she's bringing her own food and stuff. So some, some found like um, solutions, but for some people, it was just very isolating. And I think then they would associate the food with isolation and with not being, you know, with not being out there in the world and, and, and a part of it. And I think that that was difficult for some of the patients. Yeah, I love, I love to talk about that support aspect and the social aspect, because in, in a program that I was running called the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, the people that were really struggling with food addiction and trying to lose weight would do that same trick. They would go to the restaurant early, the restaurant would play, bring the food, plate it, and the restaurant would charge them for the lowest price entree. And, and, and people would do that. I found it really interesting though, how there wasn't often a lot of support you know, for, for that. And, and, and it's almost kind of mean, it's like, sort of, I work with people that are food addicts and, and a lot of times their spouses just eat all kinds of crap food in front of them. And it makes it really hard. And it's, it's the same thing. If these people were trying to eat their healthy food and the, the families just weren't on board. And the reason I say that is because there's somebody who's well known in the vegan movement, Brenda Davis, who's a dietitian who had a client who's now one of her dear friends named Andres who had cancer and she, she, he changed his diet. And literally every single person in this family said, if Andres has to eat this way, we have to eat this way. And, and the, the whole family, they were, they had other diseases. They weren't, they were just doing it in solidarity to support. And so it shocks me when people don't support their loved ones. It just, it's like, really? Yeah. I mean, I think um, that, there's there's that and there's often also there's a little bit of a um, male female difference in our culture still like and you saw that in the film where the men would still eat their regular food and would also partly demand for it to be still cooked for them by the same woman undergoing the, the treatment and not able to eat that food where I mean where's the other way around like in the case of Susan and Fred Susan obviously where Fred is was sick Susan ate the same food and you know so yeah, I, th I, I think that I, I find that strange too. Um, I, would, uh, I would assume that the, the, the family sort of adapts and makes it easier for, um, for the person to, to do that, but that's not always the case. And At least while they're going through, through the disease, you know, I mean, because they could have eaten that stuff outside the house, but I think you're so right. And this is, this is, this is just insidious, this problem. And it's just really, really sad. But I really liked Fred because he had prostate cancer and I've known so many men, uh, even family members that went the conventional route and now are impotent and incontinent and still have cancer. So, so I, are you in touch with him? Because he was great. Yeah, I haven't been in touch for, for a little while because I've been doing other projects. But yeah, I mean, um, he also came to some of our shows in, or, or to our show in Montreal, in Canada. Um, and he's amazing. I mean, he has the most incredible sense of humor. He looked amazing at that. I mean, he, he's just fantastic because he looks so much better than when I first met him. Um, and and he, you know, and he's this very manly, manly man, like, I think um, often it's also more more women that will tend to be vegans or be interested in, in the you know in nutrition and all this stuff and um, you know game changers is changing that a little bit but um, I think it's really valuable to see you know man he was a truck driver who who do this kind of thing and. Um, yeah, and have all the benefits from it. And he had, you know, stage four um, prostate cancer with metastases in his bones and seminal vesicles. And that's, you know, once you get metastases in the bones, that's very, 
very, very bad sign. I mean, that's, um, yeah, that's often, often nearing the end. Um, and yeah, um, at least uh, last I heard he was doing absolutely great. Did you find him at Gerson as well? I'd love to interview him. He was great. Yeah, yeah, he would be excellent too. Um, yes, yes, I found him through through the Gerson Institute as well. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I just I just thought the movie was just really inspiring. Yeah, and, I, and the relationship between him and Susan was, was beautiful to watch because what I did, I I would always stay at the uh, at the protagonist's house and you know really sort of be there for. Um, sometimes several weeks and and film to the you know so that they would sort of forget I'm there <laughs> after a while and um, and I would do this per periodically um, so I really got to know um, not only the characters but also their families and the um, you know the pair Susan and Fred is just incredible I've rarely seen people like that and they're like that all the time I mean they're so lovey dovey and so just beautiful to watch it's really 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 inspiring. It's been a while since I've seen it, so I definitely want to see it again, and especially if I'm going to interview the people and be re-inspired. Linda, who's watching live, says, did any of the doctors you encountered during the film switch to a plant-based diet? And I'm, I'm wondering if any of the doctors were kind of against what you were doing, like how dare you even say that food matters? Well, actually, none of the patient's doctors, um, except for one, was willing to go on camera um, and be interviewed. So... Um, and students and Tanya will be able to tell you this, um, Jeremiah's doctor, um, you know, when, 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 you know, when he was cancer free um, and she explained what he had done, um, he said, well, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's very good. And she was, you know, telling him, well, do you want more information on this? I can get you my, and he's just like, no. So, and I think this is unfortunately a common reaction. They often say like, you know, good for you, keep doing what you're doing, but I don't want to, I don't want to hear about it. Um, because, which is also, I mean, I wouldn't say it's understandable. I still think that as a doctor, you should be interested in every patient that, um, especially patients that, that um, become cancer free, you know, without doing these, um, you know, without doing chemotherapy and these um, other treatments, you should show curiosity at the very least for, for what they did and, and do a bit of research into it. But I do understand that they often don't have the time to really, um, you know, learn about it more and also don't have, where, where should they? I mean, this is not taught in medical school. This is not something that's a part of their thinking, a part of their education, a part of their whole understanding of, of medicine. So it's a lot to ask of them. You know, they, ha they have a lot to do just keeping on top of the latest medicines in their, you know, in, in oncology, um, much less try to learn a whole different field that they know nothing about. What do you think the fact that there's a lot of money in chemotherapy and very little money in vegetables has anything to do with their, some of the resistance? Of course. I mean, that's, that's basically the the issue, um, and that's the issue with medicine in general. That I think it's become so profit driven um, that that the patient is no longer the, the focus. That what's best for the patient is no longer the focus. And unfortunately, the, the same goes for the research. And science should always be independent, and it should not depend on who's financing. Um, you know, it should not depend on profit or patentability. It should, you know, just seek the truth and seek to help patients and to bring health. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the case, and or no longer the case. I mean, that's really the situation has gotten much, much worse in the last few decades. I mean, in terms of cancer research, 71% of all cancer studies are underwritten by the pharmaceutical industry, by pharmaceutical companies. So obviously they're not really independent studies. I mean, um, and even with the public, sort of the NCI, um, until 2000, I think 11, they've spent $90 billion on cancer research. They haven't spent any on researching these kinds of treatment approaches. I mean, not $1 of those 90 billion. And they're public, 
public institutions. They're using tax pay, taxpayer money. Um, so the influence of the, that sort of medical lobby and the pharmaceutical industry is huge, even on those institutions and that, you know, it shouldn't be that way. And that's, that's neither scientific nor independent, nor will it bring us progress. I mean, on the contrary, it's like it's putting the handbrake on, on progress and learning. It's almost criminal, if you ask me. It, it, it is because, you know, especially in cancer, where it's, you know, a matter of life and death. And there's, I don't think there's room there for, you know, saying, yeah, but, you know, what really matters is how much money we can make off of something or um, or even there's no room for dogma for um, ideology in terms of uh, whether whether you you believe it should be in pill form or whether you know you believe in it has to be industrial it you know anything that works and that is good for the patient and for their quality of life should be investigated and should be on the table nothing should not be on the table so long as it helps the patient. Right, which is why we need to have everybody watch this film, support it and get it out, you know. Do you think there's a chance maybe it would come on Netflix sometime or Amazon Prime where a lot of people I already so. are? I really hope so. I mean, we have a distributor, um, Gravitas, and I hope that they um, they will put it or will, that it'll be possible to put on Amazon and Netflix. I think it will come onto next week, Netflix soon. But um, it's already available on five different platforms, and I think that will just continue to grow. It's also already available um, as a DVD on Amazon. Um, so, yeah, hopefully it will start really spreading. Well, I wish you every success with it, and I'll do what I can to get the word out. And Kathleen, who's watching live, says, where does all this lead for whatever you are doing next? So I have a few new projects. Um, <laughs> I'm also still doing and I'm doing the whole filming. I also still have sort of my journalist, journalism day job, but um, I have a few new documentary projects that I'm um, pushing along. And one of them is um, sort of about soil. It's also like going the whole food thing, but taking it one step, you know, deeper where it actually comes from and, and, um, and the difference in nutrient density, depending on how something is grown and under what circumstances. Well, I've got somebody, thing. I've got somebody you've got to interview for, for it because I'm hosting a summit based on GI health. And I interviewed a, a medical doctor yesterday who is also a regenerative farmer. And this is all he talks about. You've got to interview him for this project because this is, this is like his yeah. life. Yeah, I mean, I'm so happy that regenerative agriculture is now becoming this big thing because I think that's 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 the future. <laughs> that's that's our that's our big shot. Um, and and if we don't, you know, if we don't turn in that direction pretty soon, it's gonna be it's gonna be very very difficult. And I think you can't dissociate food from from agriculture and from how thing, how things are grown and from our environment. So one of the things that the, the doctor um, that, you know, I go into the history of, of this treatment a little bit, he said that he sees the, the environment as our external metabolism. And I think that's a really beautiful notion, you know, like it's us, it's, it's a part of us. We have our internal metabolism and our external metabolism and we need to we need to take care of both. Otherwise, you know, we can't be healthy. So, any, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Did any of the people in the film end up meeting each other? Because I know they were all distinct, unique stories from all over the place. But did but once they were in the film, was there like a premiere and they got to see each other? Yeah, not all of them. Um, but uh, Fred and Marie met at um, at a screening and uh, at a premiere in in Montreal and. Marie and Michelle met at the clinic in Mexico, um, but I think that's I think that's it. Yeah, no, I have we we have to do some kind of um, you know some kind of premiere, some live event where they all come. Um, but with COVID at the moment, it's we actually had a whole um, row of um, uh, cinematic screenings uh, listed up this uh, summer and spring that has all been canceled. So. I'm sorry. Well, maybe there can be something later where we all could like have screenings in our hometowns or like through like, yeah. I have a meetup group, things like that, that because I know they did that with Forks Over Knives where you could host a host a screening. 
Yeah, actually, we did, we did a lot of that. Um, it was possible to do that for a while, and people could also ask the local um, cinema to show the food cure, and that, that worked quite well. Um, but yeah, now everything is kind of on hold. So I hope, I hope that we can do that again as soon as it's possible, because I think that this movie, because it's also such a controversial topic and such a fiery sort of people get all fiery about it, um, it's really valuable to have a debate around it and to engage um, conventional doctors, oncologists. That's really what I want to do, um, sort of go outside of the bubble of the plant-based world um, and really engage directly with a, you know, with a with a medical world that is still very reticent to this to this idea. Absolutely, and, and things are changing. Like um, Jeffrey White, Dr. Jeffrey White from the NCI, um, who's also in the film, he was very interested um, in having a, sh a shortened version of the film to show to. Um, to researchers at the NCI. So they're, they're, they're starting to be real interest. And I know several researchers who are also interested in doing some, you know, the first studies in this realm. Um, so I think we're gonna see a lot of change in the next few years. And I think what's already happened with heart disease and diabetes where it's become sort of, at least in some very progressive hospitals, it's become an option that you can do lifestyle medicine um, rather than, um, you know, you know, standard of conventional standard of care treatments. I think the same will happen eventually with cancer, maybe in 10 years, um, that it becomes integrated into, you know, into the standard of care and becomes something you can do alongside um, other treatments or, or alone with very watchful doctors checking that nothing is getting worse so that instead of it being what is happening now is that people who've gone through all the sort of conventional medicine and it's failed and they're at the end of life and they're desperate and then they start looking up like alternative medicine and food or whatever and go you know and and it's their very last shot and often it's too late and it should be the exact opposite where so long as you know, where you try these methods, these holistic sort of um, methods while watching the patient very, very monitoring the patient very, very carefully that nothing is getting worse. And then if it does get worse, then you can immediately step in with a chemotherapy with all the other treatments, but you try, you should be, be trying to, you know, boost the body's immune system and see if that, if that works. Uh, instead of to destroy it. At least I think people should have options and the knowledge so they can make an informed decision. Even with things like heart disease, instead of, I mean, sometimes people do need stents and, and things like that, but a lot of times diet would be enough, but they're not, they don't even know they're not given the option. I think that this, a lot of this should be, should be the alternative treatment and nutrition should be the standard treatment. Yeah, and, but thanks to the work of doctors like Dr. Dean Ornish and many others, that's changing even in, in, in heart disease. I mean, there's hospitals in the US where you can now make that choice. And I think that's fantastic. And that should be the case in, or that I think that will be the case with a lot of chronic diseases in, in the future. I think there will be a time where it's sort of like the Kodak moment. You know how Kodak didn't believe in digital photography and they kind of missed the boat and they said, no, we're seeing, and then they, you know, this huge company that was sort of the market leader within a very short time, um, you know, was destroyed. And I think that will eventually happen to, you know, to the, the medical, you know, those, those in the medical world that are completely against, that are not willing to integrate lifestyle medicine and food as medicine in any way, shape or form. They're just going to get taken over by everyone else and by, you know, <laughs> I can't wait for that day. Can't come soon enough. Linda Middlesworth, who is a big wig vegan in Sacramento, says after COVID, she would love to host a screening for your film. She'll get 500 people to show up because that's what she oh, does. I'm so, so glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah, please keep in touch with me. So once you know how to do that, so that I can get people to do that, because I'm good at getting people to do love things, you. apparently. So I'm yeah. Well. Uh, this is great. Well, this is the second female documentary filmmaker I've had on the show this week. And I just, I love what you do because really uh, other than comedies, documentaries are my favorite genre. I, I just love them. They're just, just, I love watching them. <laughs> yeah. I think they've become a really important um, place for good journalism too, because I mean, um, 
the, there's been a crisis in journalism. Um, I think everybody sort of knows and in the last few decades it's become more and more difficult to do high quality journalism and sort of um, investigative journalism. And this has become the last place where you can really do it um, and where you can investigate topics that are um, controversial and, and you know, different from what's in the mainstream uh, media. And so I think it's really, really important. Documentaries are where, where nowadays you can get a lot of education and a lot of knowledge um, that you know, maybe before was in newspapers. And um, yeah, now documentaries are the place to find that stuff. Have you done other films other than this one? No, I actually, uh, I did a master's degree in film and then um, what, did another master's in, in journalism and never really came back to film until I did this film. So it's my first sort of feature length um, documentary. Um, yeah, and, and it was such a long project that um, the next one I hope is not going to take as long, um, but you never know. <laughs> So I, I was, I mean, again, people don't have to be vegan to be on my show, but I was pleased to discover that you've been one for 10 years. How did you come about to that way of eating? Well, through this, through this film, um, through the research I was, I was doing, and then I read the China study and all this other, um, I did a lot, a lot of research and I interviewed a lot of um, uh, experts. Um, and I did it first just kind of as a test um, because that's what the patients were doing and just kind of, um, and then, you know, once you, once you sort of see the effects, um, it becomes sort of obvious, but I have to say, I'm not, um, a lot of vegans, um, are, are angry about people like me because, um, often when I, you know, I do a lot of reporting, uh, in sort of strange and difficult places and I will, eat basically anything I'm served when I'm in these places. So I'm a vegan when I'm at home in my um, surroundings and, and uh, yeah. Well, that, you know, a lot of vegans are angry. They're angry at me because my dog's not vegan. So what are you going to tell you? Can't please everybody. So, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm just happy that, you know, and I know the day will come where you will be a hundred percent because we talked about it. It is harder when you travel, especially <laughs> really hard and especially this kind of I think a lot of my my work has always been sort of um getting you know I'm very chameleonic I speak five languages I come from a like mixed cultural background so I I really like this idea of wherever I am just sort of adapting to people eating whatever they eat I never say like I try to avoid staying in hotels and always stay with families and just sort of you know not not be a bother um and and so that makes it more difficult um, to, yeah, you know, especially in a lot of places. Unfortunately, the whole world has, you know, developed very bad eating habits, not, not the whole world, but most of the world. Um, so um, for the time that I'm in these places, I will, I will um, take those on, but I really feel the difference. And sometimes that's the thing that I miss the most is like my own food and having control of, of that food. Yeah. Well, uh, you must have a very interesting microbiome. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is there a charge to see this film? Because Layla's saying outside the U.S. we have to pay to watch the film. Yeah, in the U.S. too. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think in the U.S. it's like a $3.99 or something for, for a stream on most platforms. Um, I think it's a bit more in, in outside of the US because we just launched it outside of the US and in, in the US it's been available since June. So yeah. Well, yeah. It's, def it's definitely worth it. So please consider supporting this worthwhile project. And I, I've been posting the link, the whole show where you just click it and they'll tell you the different platforms. Yeah, and, and I'd be really happy if people also review it. Um, it's always good to hear what people think about it, um, whether it's critical or not. Um, it's just really great. To, to get some feedback and some sense of, you know, what people, what people think. Um, and so, yeah, please review it. And, and we can review it, I guess, on Amazon. Yeah, and on, uh, I'm not sure exactly where, I think, all, I think on yeah. all of the platforms, there's a review. Um, That's right. It's less than a cup of coffee, guys. So please consider supporting the film. Well, thank you for the work you do. You're just really a remarkable young lady. And I, I, I you just, it's amazing what you've accomplished because you look very young to me. So I, I look forward to more, much more uh, important work from you. 
Well, thank you so much, AJ. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> You're so welcome. You are beautiful. So thank you so much. And thank you guys for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Like I said, please consider supporting this film. It's less than the price of a smoothie. And it, it could make a difference in your life or somebody's life, especially if you know somebody with cancer. And please come back at 2 p.m. today when I will be speaking with Jerry Casados. He's a registered dietitian talking about a plant-based lifestyle and debunking the myths. Thanks again, Sarah. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.